about the geocaching merit badge. Uh, geocache is a combination of the words earth and cache, and it basically describes the hiding place. Uh, anywhere you can hide something on the planet Earth is a geocache. We use the global positioning system, which is a bunch of satellites up in space, uh, as an electronic tool to show us where uh, we are on the planet based on what's called trilateration. Information. It's an outdoor activity where we use a GPS receiver or a mobile device uh, to hide and seek containers called geocaches or caches anywhere over the world. Typically a geocache is a small container. It's got a log book, a pen or pencil to write in it. Uh, you sign your log. You can also use a mobile phone to do an electronic log. Um, and then you put the cache back where you found it when you're done. There's all different sizes, trinkets, uh, trackables, and other items inside of a geocache. The merit badge are listed here. Almost every requirement won in a merit badge is safety related. And uh, number two on this is revolves around a lot of leave no trace. And then three, we start getting into terms that are specific to geocaching. Five, uh, map reading. In six, we're going to talk about finding a cache using uh, a laptop or a cell phone. And then uh, lastly, in number seven and eight, uh, we're actually going to do some geocaching. Website, which is geocaching.com. Dave Ulmer, uh, after they turned off the selective bit, which enabled uh, you, the GPSs to go from about 20 or plus meters down to roughly four and a half meters uh, posted on usenet this uh i've did it i've created the first stash hunt stash and here are the coordinates and he lists the uh latitude and longitude and uh you know leave some stuff take some stuff have some fun and there's a picture of dave ulmer uh at that original cache they put a plaque uh long after Be careful what to do uh, if someone approaches you. We're going to talk about caching on private property, uh, what to do if the coordinates are off and not paying attention, and finding your way back. Uh, you always want to be uh, cognizant of uh, where you started. You can easily roam off and get lost. Online safety. As a uh, Boy Scout, in both the Scout and Star rank, you're required to earn your cyber chip. Uh, make certain that you complete that. Safety pitch is part of this cyber chip. Uh, think before you post, respect other people online, respect digital media ownership. Uh, don't meet anyone face to face you meet on the internet unless you have your parents permission. Always protect yourself online. A little bit on those first topics. Uh, if someone approaches you, normally the best thing to do is to avoid them. They, you see them coming to you. Um, this is no different than Pokemon Go. Uh, people are going to ask what you're doing, why you're holding your phone, why you, maybe you're taking photos. Uh, they potentially could want to engage you in dialogue. Uh, it's usually best to avoid it, but if not, be respectful. Um, explain what it is you're doing. If you're on private property, which you shouldn't be, uh, you want to uh, you know, heed them and potentially leave uh, the scene to avoid any kinds of problems. Um, we're now going to get into some of the first aid topics uh, listed here. What we want to do is make sure you stop the bleeding. How do we stop the bleeding? We apply direct pressure, elevate uh, with any kind of clean cloth. Then the next step would be to clean or, uh, the cut or wound. Uh, some soap and water, protect it. Apply antibiotic cream over the infection and cover with a sterile. Always be careful with uh, in either cuts or scrapes. Uh, wash your hands, stop the bleeding, clean the wound, apply an antibiotic. Petroleum jelly is also great for uh, scrapes. Uh, cover the wound, change the dressing as needed. Be wary of whether or not you need a tetanus shot. If you got a scrape and it was a rusty piece of metal, you may very well need a tetanus shot. Look for inflammation. Be wary of signs of Recognize the guy on the left there? He's a Timbler rattlesnake. Uh, if the person, uh, and the best thing to do is don't approach a snake. 
Uh, nine times out of ten, you're going to get bit trying to pick up a snake, approach a snake. Uh, you always want to leave them alone, right? But if you are bit by a snake, uh, you want to make certain you move the person beyond the striking distance of it. They could get struck two, three times if you just lay down next to a snake. Uh, keep the person calm and at rest, remaining as calm as possible. Um, you always want to uh, cover the wound with a loose and sterile bandage. The other thing that is helpful is if you have a Sharpie or a pen, is to actually circle where the snake bite is at. As the uh, wound tends to darken, it's helpful uh, different time periods to know how fast it's spreading. Uh, it's really uh, unlikely that you're going to die from a venomous snake bite, um, but uh, you always want to seek medical treatment uh, whenever you are. Don't try and take the snake with you to the hospital. They have no desire. Even if the head's cut off, there still could be venom in the fangs. The last thing you want is a snake. Uh, this is a great product I love, Afterbite. Uh, it's a great uh, sting uh, uh, remover. Uh, another one is some uh, vinegar. Um, but uh, Move the person to a safe area. If it's, say, a beehive or something like that, you want to get out of danger. Uh, if needed, remove the stinger, wash with soap and water. If they are extremely allergic to uh, bees or snake or whatever bit them, uh, whatever insect it was, they very, may very well be uh, needing an EpiPen. Um, typically, a person in this scenario has one with them. Uh, typically, they'll start to inflame, maybe trouble breathing. Uh, if any of this is a, a concern, make certain you take them uh, to uh, an emergency room or call an ambulance or 911. Remove the tick promptly and carefully. Don't attempt to try and burn the tick off of you. You're more likely to suffer from, from burns and other items. Um, this is a tick removal tool. It's great for removing ticks. Uh, most tick bites are harmless and don't need medical treatment. Some ticks do carry diseases. Uh, keep an eye out for red bumps, uh, dots on the ankles, flu-like symptoms, fever, headache, fatigue, vomiting, any of that. Some of these. Is this? If you said poison oak, poison ivy, very common in uh, other Florida poisonous plants out there that you may come across. And a lot of these animals, if they eat them, are uh, toxic and. Uh, can make the animal sick as well. Usually you would want some Xanfel. It's expensive. It's not cheap. Uh, it's not normally carried in every store, but you do. There is a product. This is the only product on the market uh, that will help stop the itching and the rash. Other than that, soap, water, um, maybe uh, some, uh, some other homemade remedies on there. Uh, but you do want to, especially if they get it in their face or in their armpits or their genitals, I would seek professional attention, go to the hospital. If they have any trouble breathing, you need to seek medical attention. I normally recommend uh, lidocaine, allocaine, any of the ones that end with a cane are great to help with the uh, severe uh, sunburn. Uh, you want to apply it to the cool skin. Have them take a cool bath or shower. Uh, ibuprofen and acetaminophen uh, can uh, make them feel better. If there are any blisters, do not break the blisters. And so remember, in heat exhaustion, they're sweating. In heat stroke, they're not. Uh, heat stroke can lead symptoms. Also, with the heat stroke, their pupils will be constricted or really small. And again, they're going to have a very high uh, body temperature. Heat stroke is extremely bad. Uh, exhaustion. Maybe the person is sweating. Have them lay down. Get them to a shady area. Give them some drinks. Make certain you don't give them something with cat. Great. Uh, person with a heat stroke, very similar. You may want to remove loose articles of clothing. Expose as much skin to the air as possible to help them cool down. Sponge them with water, spray them with a fan, um, whatever it takes. Watch out for seizures, unconsciousness. Um, ice packs are great. 
at the core of the body uh, in all cases give them fluids I would most likely uh, have someone see medical attention for a heat stroke for that person keep an eye on their body temperature and if they stop breathing perform rescue breathing don't give aspirin or acetaminophen when they've got that high body temperature uh, that can resort, re resort in uh, the body's unresponsiveness It. Now we're all of a sudden we're way too cold. We got some frostbit hands. Notice that the temperature uh, you can still get mild hypothermia when the body is just a couple degrees below normal. Uh, you know your body temperature is not going to drop down to 40 to get hypothermia. It only has to drop down a couple degrees to 95 for mild hypothermia to start to kick in. Different phases of hypothermia. Notice this is in Celsius. Thermia, shivering, dizziness, feeling hungry, nausea, rapid breathing, problem speaking, slurred speech, confusion, coordination difficulties, fatigue, a rapid heart rate, uh, shivering, I mentioned again, drowsiness, weak pulse, shadow, clothing, warm the trunk first, do not warm hands and feet first. Warm the trunk first, warming extremities first can cause neck uh, and such forth. Make certain you guys are drinking water while you're geocaching. Always drink water. Your body is constantly losing water. Um, I like none tablets. How do I know if I'm getting enough uh, water? Well, when you use the toilet, take a look. Based on the color, it can help tell you whether you're getting enough fluids in you. Body system, make certain when you're out geocaching with a scout that you always go in pairs of two. That'll also help if someone approaches you. Um, it makes certain you tell someone where you're going, when you're going, when you'll return. Uh, and uh, make certain you leave a note if you drive out somewhere, you're old enough to drive, and you go for a hike uh, down a path. Make certain you leave something on the dashboard if they come looking for you because you don't return to the car, at least they know the route you went. And where else. Make certain you check the weather. The last thing you want to do is be outside geocaching when a lightning storm is approaching. Always look at the barometer. If the barometer is rising, the weather should be looking better. If the barometer is dropping, then a low pressure is bringing strong winds uh, and precipitation and most likely it's going to rain. If you get caught outside as a group in, the, uh, in, a, in a lightning storm, you need to find a dry low area like a depression or a ravine. Avoid uh, trees, tall objects, rocky outcrops, ledges. The last thing you want to be is up on the top of a mountain uh, during a lightning storm. If you're in an open area, you need to just crouch down with your heels touching, uh, head between your uh, toes, your hands covering your ears. Minimize your contact with the ground, but do not lie down flat. Um, take shelter in a car or a building if one's nearby. Avoid bodies of water. Do not be out on a lake in the middle of a lightning storm. Absolutely not. Think about all the things of leave no trace. We don't want to be digging around. We don't want many people digging up yards, properties, national forests, looking Leave no trace in the geocaching etiquette. Stay away from roads. I mean, just speak, make common sense. You, nobody's going to put a geocache in the middle of the interstate. Nobody's going to put a geocache where you got to swim a mile to go get it. Um, you know, just keep an eye uh, out where stuff is. Pay attention to what you're doing. Uh, respect the environment. Don't bury it unless, you know, there's circumstances where you can bury it. You need to look at the geocaching.com website and I'll give you some examples. Um, and then always respect private property. When you go to submit a geocache, they're going to they're gonna deny it for so many different rules. Uh, too close to another geocache, too close to a church, too close to a hospital, too close to this, too close to that. It's uh, harder and harder to find a good spot for a geocache. Um, but they're not going to let you submit one to geocaching.com if it's on a military installation or if it's on school property, um, things like that. And they don't want you putting one where people think there could be a terrorist attack. They're not going to let you stick a geocache in the middle of a Starbucks so that people can wander in and out looking for them. 
certain you pay attention to the seven leave no trace principles, plan ahead and prepare, travel and camp on durable services, dispose of waste properly, leave what you find, minimize campfire impacts, respect wildlife, and be considerate. Your uh, weekly scouting meetings, the outdoor coach should now be included in everything you do. You'll be tested on it all the way through Eagle. reference point on earth it's basically a way for us to designate a spot it's a place um, geocaching generates a unique GC code for every geocache listing so here I've got a Garmin eTrex 30 I've got a waypoint screen pulled up this is waypoint 57 there's no note there's a location in latitude and longitude in elevation and then I can map it I've also got another example where uh, I've changed it from 057 to SB Knife Edge. I've put a friendly note on when I found it. And I've changed my position format to show a different format. This is called UTM, as you can see. Elevation, all of that good stuff. Log, it's basically a record. It can be either a sheet of paper or you can use electronic log books. But there's a lot of people that do geocaching that don't have a smartphone that still want to sign a log book. So DNF is do not find, uh, FTF is first to find, but you typically want to maintain some sort of log book with a pen inside of your cache so that when people find it, they can see um, Geocache, cache kind of intertwined. Originally called it a stash. People didn't like the word stash, so they changed it to cache from geocache. You're hunting virtual things you're actually hunting physical things how accurate are gps receivers they are accurate down to about 16 feet uh, previously with selective availability they were accurate to about 45 feet so they've gotten pretty accurate a has enabled to allow airplanes to be even more uh more accurate um not everywhere you can receive WAS, and when I turn on my Garmin with WAS, the battery declines even faster. So I don't necessarily always turn WAS on, but it uses a network of ground-based reference stations to provide feedback to the satellite signals, uh, but it's an option you have to turn on. The difficulty rating, one to five stars. Five is the hardest, one is the easiest. money to park there where their dogs are allowed can you bring your horse no hunting is there hours is there parking attributes are uh, examples you may have to rock climb to find this one this one requires an ATV there's a park bench here uh, well may not require an ATV but there's ATV allowed uh, there's snow here uh, water is available you got to walk through water you need snowshoes, all sorts of attributes. Inside of your cache, there's typically a trackable. There's a lot of different types. There's travel. Some people like to put dollar bills with a stamp on them in your box where they recorded the serial number. And when you get it, they want you to, you know, move it from cache to cache and record that serial number and where. I'm going to talk a little bit about GPS and maps. So here we got a bunch of satellites that, based upon the information from at least three satellites, you can use trilateration. Satellite one here, satellite two here, satellite three in the bottom right, and you've got a receiver. You can use trilateration to figure out. satellites instead of three now I got 30 that's floating around have satellites the Russian equivalent so you know you only need three um, we really need four to get uh, uh, how high above sea level you are um, but as you can see with all these com countries uh, coming online 
locate where you are, what your waypoint is, uh, which is a position on Earth. An artist uh, rendition of the Navstar 2F. There's at least uh, 30 of these up in space. I think there's some maintenance spares. Maybe there's only 27. I think it varies on, on how many. But you need really three to four to be able to get a good location. not getting just three to four I'm getting one two three four five six seven that are really good signal and then some more that are pretty good signal um, I don't know what the colors are I think the the blue might be the GLONASS uh, that's the Russian thing this is a um, we're just talking about position format uh, notice uh, Google Earth here I've got pulled up uh, it's got a pretty good menu. Your GPS, anything to do with uh, navigation and satellites, there's different formats that people use. There's really like 30 or 40 different formats. But here are the five big ones that Google Maps lets you use are decimal degree, degrees, minutes, seconds, degrees, decimal minutes, UTM, and the military grid reference system. The most common one we use on land is UTM. It's a meter system. I'll talk about it a little more as we go. measure things but you could say this building that we're at is at this latitude and longitude in degrees minutes seconds or you could say the exact same thing in degrees decimal minutes or you could say the same thing in UTM 17 R uh, 447,853 easting meters east by 3,335,945.86 meters north. I'll talk a little bit more about you. Position format. I go into that and then I get to pick one of these 20 or 30 or 40 position formats and then it's going to ask what the map did. And if I look at the map I'm getting stuff off of, I usually match it up, but WGS84 is the common graphic maps. I'm always wanting to, I don't rely 100% on geocaching smartphone app and their, and their map on their website. I like to look at old fashioned topographic maps. So I go to the store.usgs.gov and I I'm looking at today. I know uh, based on this map, this is Interstate 95, this is Interstate 295. I know that where I'm at is back in here. And if I drill down a little further, I actually see the lake that we're in front of, and I know that this is my lake. I pull out my GPS, and I basically match up the information along the sidelines. I'm always buying 124,000 scale maps. Uh, they have a lot of detail. You can get a map that is further out with a bigger area, 150,000. So I'm also looking, remember we talked about the datum on a map, uh, NAD83. WSG 84 and that I'm in zone 17 R and this is a thousand meter grid universal transverse Mercator why am I using UTM and why am I not using latitude and longitude latitude and longitude was primarily developed uh, for waterborne navigation using uh, I think that's a sextant as I recall so you've got latitude lines and you've got longitude lines. Not as precise as the UTM but I, that I don't have to account for with UTM. Here's one of my compass uh, maps on it for 124 thousandths uh, direction of travel and index line. A bearing uh, so I can use this with my from maptools.com I like to buy this little tool for UTM I'll show a little bit more so why would you use a GPS versus maps well do you know if you pull out the old State Farm Road Atlas trying to figure out where you're at which is a little easier pulling out your cell phone and clicking on Google Maps or in your car clicking on the maps usually it's the cell phone and the car navigation it knows from the satellites where you are however what happens if the car dies what happens if your cell phone dies 
I still like to keep an atlas in the back seat. You never know when you just might need one. Your phone dies and you don't know where you're at. ATM, it provides a constant distance relationship anywhere on a map. In angular coordination sy coordinate systems like latitude and longitude, the distance covered by degree of longitude differs as you move toward the poles and only equals the distance covered by a degree of latitude at the equator. So there's some variation depending on where you're at with latitude and longitude. And with land navigation with a small part of the earth, the UTM allows you to be tied back to negative numbers or east-west designators. Uh, grid values increase from left to right and from bottom to top. Just like the Cartesian uh, map system uh, you learn about in high school, simple Cartesian mathematics is used, no, no special trigonometry, everything's decimal based, one, tens, hundreds. Um, it's based on the measure. Point on a map, this is a working exercise, we'll actually do this. Notice my map tools, I've got a couple different. Here's a 150 thousandths uh, for a map. Here's a 125 thousandths, here's a 124. I basically line this map tool up to measure, uh, you know, more precise. coordinates, you'll soon recognize the format. Uh, there's a zone number, there's a hemisphere number, we're in north. There's an easting number that is called in the door. We basically go east first on the map. Once we go east, then we go up, which is our northing number. And then we've got meters, 10 meter, 100 meter, 1,000 meter, 10,000 meter, 100,000 meter, and million. Notice the zero here. It's commonly left off. When I wrote it down on my maps, I left the zero off. But if you're going to put this into a Garmin, you need to add the zero first. Don't leave the zero off when you're putting it into the Garmin. Otherwise, it messes up and thinks you're somewhere else. talked about I am in zone 17 right now which is Florida so I am in zone 17 and I am in the north uh, part of the uh, the map letters assigned to it I am actually in 17 R is where I am located. yeah you know this is the earth and we do the UTM grid based on the equator Zone 16, uh, hemisphere or row letter N. Uh, and then I've got the easting, which is in the door. And then the northing, which is up the stairs. In order to enter a house, you have to go in the door with the easting. And then you have to go up the stairs with the northing. So in the door, then up the stairs. So we always do the easting first, and then the northing. I'm in section 10S, that's the map number. And if I look down at the bottom, there's a small seven. You'll, you'll, you'll wanna skip this, you know, you'll go like this and go, oh, zero six, where's that at? You forget about the small seven in the front, which is in the millions. So I'm gonna basically read over on the map to the right in the door until I get to roughly where this is at. And then I'm gonna follow the northing and I'm gonna move my way north to this spot right here. So I read the bottom of the map. A disregard on the bottom of the map if there's latitude and longitude information. We are using UTM coordinates. Both of them will be on a map. You have to ignore the latitude and longitude. We're focusing in this class on UTM. You're basically coming in the door and then you're going up based upon the tool. Your map, I'm basically following the uh, the uh, numbers at the bottom and I'm basically going in the door and then I'm going up and that's how I knew that where we're at is actually right here on this map. So We'll practice some map finding exercises but the next step is to look at geocaching.com you'll have to research a geocache that's near you uh, pay attention to safety hunt for the geocache, and then once you find it, you'll find it. it. It can figure out if you turn on uh, Enable My Location on a PC or on a cell phone, it'll know where you're at, it'll pop up a list of locations that are near you, 
These are the ones that are near me now. And use my phone to pull up the same location and then now exercises now using my cell phone to find a cache that's nearby. What are your questions about geocaching? And check out these cool caches. Here's an ammo can that's painted. There's a uh, tie wing fighter. No, that's an X wing fighter. Oh no, it's a tie wing, right? Uh, this is one that's hidden in a log. It's a pot. Uh, games with my Garmin GPS using Campbell soup cans. I'll hide the St. Campbell soup cans. I'll make a waypoint. I'll write it down on a piece of paper. I'll then delete all the waypoints out of my Garmin and then have the scout enter in uh, the, you know, I'll give him a piece of cardboard with a written uh, cream of mushroom on it and he has to navigate, go find cream of soup and bring in southern Jacksonville, Florida uh, that you could actually find their soup cans at various locations. Make certain you put them back, never move a cash when you're done. All right, well, hopefully you've enjoyed